Okay, it is uh, one o'clock and we're going to call this meeting to order and it's nice to see live faces around this table. Uh, welcome everybody and nice to have a little bit of a free from the heat. Proceeding to this meeting will be recorded and made available on the internet. If we could have the roll call, please. Thank you, Mayor Clarkson. Are you present? I am. Deputy Mayor Wendover? Present. Councillor Armstrong? Present. Councillor Franzen? Present. Councillor Lampshead? Present. Her staff, Donna Taggart, CAO Treasurer? Present. Steve Brockbank, Director of Emergency Services? Present. Dylan Kosh, Director of Recreation and Facilities? Present. Evan Grieger, Director of Public Works? Present. Barb Waldron, Director of Building and Planning, CBO? Present. Adele Arbor, Planner? Present. Ann Ruth, Deputy Clerk? Present. Sarah Delamarter, Junior Planner? Present. Bianca Dragicevic, Legislative Coordinator, Executive Assistant to the CAO? Present. And Jesse Clark, Director of Corporate Services Clerk, is present. Thank you, now we're going to do our land acknowledgement and moment of reflection. We respectfully acknowledge the Trent Lakes in Peterborough County are located on the Treaty 20 Michisaugi Territory and an inter-traditional territory of the Michisaugi and Chippewa Nations, collectively known as the Williams Treaties First Nations, which include Alderville, Beausoleil, Cove Lake, Georgina Island, Hiawatha, Rama, and the Scugog Island First Nations. Trent Lakes respectfully acknowledges that the Williams Treaty First Nations are the stewards and caretakers of these lands and waters in perpetuity, that they continue to maintain this responsibility to ensure their health and integrity for generations to come. We will now take a moment to reflect on these principles and our duties and responsibility as members of council. Thank you. Now we would like to express our sympathies to Dolly Kosh, Director of Recreation Facilities on the passing of his grandfather. Disclosure of pecuniary interest, remind council members of their obligation to declare any pecuniary interest they may have now or at any time that they appear in the future. Uh, through you, Mark Clarkson, it appears we may be having some audio issues, so um, I'm just going to mute the room now and see if we can resolve them. Dan, is this any better? You sound very far away, Jesse. Is this any better? Much better. Um, if I could, I could just ask Councillor Armstrong to do a test. Sure. Can you hear me out? I can. Thank you. Okay, seems like it's resolved. Okay, and uh, another um, person we need to remember are the families of John Bannon. John Bannon, uh, probably the oldest uh, living resident in Buckhorn, died this week at the age of 100. John had a really, really colorful life from Air Force to OPP to one of the founding members of the BCC. Uh, his uh, obituary is quite lengthy and quite uh, involved. So if anybody's interested in, um, you know, old people who are passing on, uh, it's an interesting read that I would suggest that maybe take a moment and do so. Okay, can I get a motion to approve the agenda, please? Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Francis, all in favor? Pardon? Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's why people should read this. Yeah, we should. Yeah. 
dad got a medal in the trenches in the First World War from the king. Anyway, we need adoption of the minutes from the special council meeting of July the 7th, the regular council meeting of July the 12th, and a special council meeting of July the 12th, uh, 27th. Uh, one motion, please. And that would be Terry Lamb's head. <laughs> I did it. Hey. I wrote it down. <laughs> Seconded by Councillor Armstrong. <laughs> All in favor. Motion is carried. Committees and Boards Economic Development Advisory Committee, Library Board, Key Services Board. Motion to receive these minutes, please. Deputy Member, Councillor Hanson. All in favor. Motion has uh, carried. Just one question on the economic development. Yep. Uh, do we have any further information on what you have vote? No. Okay. No, um, I think um, uh, it was looked into, and they're not sure whether they're coming into this area or not. They're still under advice as to whether or not they will okay. move in. They are in Arito. Uh, they have several, and uh, from what uh, from what uh, oh Don, you were on that meeting. Uh, I think what they suggested is call back after the first of the year to see just what their uh, what their schedule is going to look like. Okay. It's an interesting. Um, Thing because what you do is you rent the boat, so it's like a it's like a an upscale houseboat, okay. a little bit smaller, okay. and people rent it for three days or four days and they actually do whatever they get picked up. So it's uh, it's kind of a it's sort of a cross between a tour boat and a houseboat. Okay. Sure, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sure. Okay. Uh, any other questions on those minutes? No. Okay. And I think we voted on it, or we didn't. No. No. Okay. Most of us tried. I think we are still having audio issues, so I'm going to try and resolve them again.
Dan, can you hear us now? I'm not sure what station you're at, just so you sound far away. Dan, can you hear us? Good. I can hear you, but you're faint. You sound far away. Can you hear me now? That's a little bit better. Uh, Councilor Franzen, could you do a test as well, please? Yeah, hello. That saying is quite clear, yes. Okay. Okay, we're going to try again. We're going to try again. Okay, liaison reports for council boards and committees. Have we anyone who would like to speak to economic development, uh, the Parks and Rec, Police Services Board, or the Library Board? Police Services Board is going to be interesting. There's a move to uh, uh, make all of the speed limit 60 as opposed to the 80. And uh, the, the notices will be roads are 60 unless otherwise posted. So there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not we can actually make this work in these municipalities. Will people pay any attention to them? But they're pretty firm about what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Now, our crime situation has stayed pretty much the same. Uh, we're not, we're not, we're neither up or down. The uh, situation with the uh, overdoses and everything is pretty much the same as it is in the city. Uh, very much here, not for us to think that we don't have it is not the case, we do. But not to any, uh, not to an extent that's any larger. But the major part of the discussion had to do with the uh, speed limits. So it's going to put a lot of work on uh, our departments because they've got to change all the signs and you know, education and all the rest of this stuff. So there is no discussion about 36 yet? About? Uh, 36. I believe the county was supposed to deal with uh, uh, the recommendation we made that it should be uh, 60 in, in front at Nobis Creek. I don't think there's been any Okay. Discussion. They've had it since February. Huh? There was there was a motion at County Council on it in February, mm -hmm. and it's been deferred all the way along. Well, this will probably fix that. <laughs> anyway, I can't I can't uh, for the life of me I can't see it working. But anyway, they've got they've got that idea what in their was, heads. What was it again, Janet? Just from the sixty. Yeah. Everywhere. Everywhere that's yeah. So if like it, now, if you take a test, it says, unless a road says otherwise, you can assume it's going to be 80. Yeah. The assumption now is going to be 60. Yeah. I heard something on the radio that seemed quite, kind of interesting, is that they have figures for homicide, but they don't have figures for femicide. Uh, women killed by their spouses or significant others, or women killed because they're women. and. I, I think that's a pretty important issue. And maybe you could bring it up, Jen. Okay. There have been a couple of corner inquiries where oh, that's one of the recommendations. Yeah, I because, thought I'd heard. Because homicide indicates man, not woman. Ah. Well, homo means male. These days, it means a lot of things. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> statutory public meeting pursuant to the Planning Act. If we could have a motion to suspend the regular meeting, and okay, Deputy Mayor Windover, and now I've lost it again. Councillor <laughs> Armstrong answer. seconds. Councillor Armstrong is a seconder. Oh. All in favor? All right. Now we're into the into this. If we could have Sarah introduce this file, number 22-23. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, this is a public meeting under Section 34 of the Planning Act to consider an amendment to the Municipalities Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, B2014-070. A notice of public meeting for today's application containing the prescribed information was circulated to all landowners within 120 meter radius of the subject lands at least 20 days prior to this meeting. 
The notice was also mailed to all prescribed agencies, public bodies, and persons in accordance with the regulations. Anyone wanting to be notified of any decision from today's public meeting must send in a written request to either myself or the clerk and the notice of passing will be mailed to them, setting out the manner and method in which appeals may be made to the Ontario Land Tribunal. Please note that if a person does not send a written comment prior to the passing of the bylaw or make an oral submission at a public meeting, that person may not be entitled to appeal the decision. Thank you. So this is a public meeting for file number 22-23 to consider a zoning bylaw amendment submitted by agent Holly Richards Conley on behalf of the property owners Amy Potter and Wade Halbert for the rural residential lot known municipally as 68 Sumcott Drive. The subject land has a lot area of approximately 0.25 hectares and a street frontage of approximately 20 meters. The lot is currently occupied by a detached dwelling and an attached garage with a combined total floor area of 230 square meters. The applicant is proposing a new detached garage with a floor area of 98.85 square meters in order to run a fabrication business. There is a planning report on today's agenda from the municipality's external planning consultant, Chris Jones. Chris's report notes that the applicant's home industry primarily involves the fabrication of custom stairway structures, which includes welding, grinding, and cutting steel together with some accessory woodworking, where wood finishings are incorporated with the stair design. Chris also notes that there is no requirement for outdoor storage or retail space, nor does the business generate an increase of truck traffic, with the exception of the delivery of raw materials and pickup for the final product. It is noted that the owner employs two people for the business. Chris's report identifies that the proposal is generally consistent with the provincial policy statement and growth plan. The municipality is in receipt of several comments pertaining to the proposal. Comments received from Curve Lake First Nations recommends an archeological assessment where soils are to be disturbed. And Peterborough Public Health has submitted comments that an existing sewage system review must be undertaken for the subject property. Uh, Trillium Lakelands District School Board have indicated that they have no identifiable, cons identifiable concerns related to the property. The municipality has received one letter of opposition from a member of the public, which outlines concerns with vehicular traffic, increased noise, fire hazards, and decreased property value. Six consent notifications in support of the proposal were received from members of the public. Mr. Jeff Woolacott has requested an opportunity to speak at today's meeting. Further, if any members of the public did not register with the clerk indicating their intent to make an oral submission but would like to do so at this time, please use the raise a hand feature so that we are able to promote you in order for you to make an oral submission. Thank you. We have Jeff Wollacott on the line. If you're unmuted, if you wanted to make your presentation. Okay, we can't seem to be hearing Jeff. Um, if any other members of the public want to speak, they can use the raise a hand feature. Holly Richards Conley is available. If you can unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon. I'm just the agent on the file and am here to answer any questions or concerns that council may have from any public deputations or anything that they've read in Chris's report. Okay, uh, council, any questions? Yes. I have a couple of comments. Uh, just that uh, it, it's a, a residential area with relatively small lots and uh, people moving into that kind of area expect it to stay a residential area without uh, uh, small processing plants or factories or etc. So I, I, I think it, uh, I don't think it's an appropriate area to, to build that kind of business. Okay. 
Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, a question, don't know if you can answer this, Holly. Are there any other like home industries in that uh, community? Or would this be a first? Um, I'm actually not certain of other home industries in the area. Um, just to sort of go back one comment from um, the other councillor, this is not a processing plant. This is a very, very small uh, woodworking um, business. They make um, very, very custom staircases for custom homes. Um, you know, one set of stairs is worked on at a time and they use these beautiful wood, glass, and um, steel railings for these homes. It's it's not a processing plant in any way, shape, or form. It is just that, a very small home industry business. Any other questions? Councillor Lamsay? Just a question about noise. I mean, if it's being operated inside and working on things and the doors are closed, I don't see it in disturbing neighborhoods, but I think if it's open and you're grinding and welding and carrying on and sanding, that, that is quite noisy for your neighborhood. So I, I think it's, it's kind of a concern that we, we need to make sure the doors are closed when we work. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I can um, speak to all of those issues. Um, the, 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 um, the building is ICF, so it has a very, very high um, sound rating and the materials that are used to build these stairs, especially the wood, um, needs a climate controlled environment. So the entire structure has to be um, closed at all times as the, the, like the doors can't be open, especially in the summertime and humidity and obviously in the winter it's freezing. So there's never a window or a door open um, in, the, in the shop. Thank you very much. Okay. Anybody else? We do have another hand uh, raised, Laura McGill, I'll unmute you now. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I am a residence, resident of Suncon Drive. I don't live near that lot, but we have a problem on our street uh, with traffic speeding all the time and many trucks going up and down. This industry that you, uh, this uh, resident is proposing will increase the traffic. For sure, there will be deliveries of materials. How much, how many times a week, how many uh, welding, uh, uh jobs are there i understand that this is going to be heavy on welding and cutting steel and iron i feel that a person needs to go into an industrial area to do this type of work this is a residential area and it would certainly lower the values of our homes it, and it would set a precedent. What is it? I could apply for the same kind of thing next week as soon as it's passed and say, well, you gave it to this man and I would like the same uh, type of industry in my, in, in my, you know, it's not a home office. It's, it, uh, it, people are going to be parking on the street. They are now, because he's doing some business there now, and they are parking on the street. So I really would like, I am very concerned with the increased traffic of that magnitude trucks. Staircases, and I understand they do railings, they require large, vehicles not cars not little vans and not pickups to move them so because of the traffic situation on the street whereby people are you know having to step off the, the road quickly uh, because of uh, speeding traffic and you know i think there's just going to be uh, a negative situation for the residents I really think that this person should consider going to an industrial area. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? I have a question. 
Um, is there any kind of subdivision agreement in that uh, subdivision? Uh, are there any restrictions in that area? I, I know that in uh, in Pirates Glen we have certain restrictions uh, of what we can do. Uh, we can't put signage up or to advertise any kind of business. It was something we signed before we, we bought the house. I would wonder if there's any kind of uh, agreement in some cost. I don't think, I don't think there's so anybody at this table can answer that question. Jesse, um, where would you go to find that out? Um, I would refer that question to planning staff. We have Sarah and Adele, or possibly Barb on the line, who may be able to answer. Okay. Would either of the three of you like to pipe in here if you're there? Through you, Madam Mayor, I'm not aware of any provision um, in the subdivision agreement, but it's something that we can go back and look at, just take another look at it, but I'm not aware of any provision such as that. I would, uh, my comment is, I think the, we're, we're encouraging home industries. Obviously we're not going to get factories that are going to employ a lot of people. But having said that, the welding and the cutting of material bothers me because that's a noise that will permeate almost any any substance that you put out there. So I think it would be, uh, I think it's very wise of us to determine what that volume of noise would be because the decision we make today is going to drive people crazy in the, in the, in the future if the, if the noise is not, um, uh, ad is not adequately controlled and I doubt very much of it can be. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, um, if I may, um, the zoning for this property does permit a home industry, which does include a metal and welding shop. Um, and this zoning bylaw amendment is to permit a, uh, a specific building on the said lot in order to run and operate the, the business. If this building being proposed were to conform to zoning regulations, it technically would be considered a permitted use. So it's it, it's merely the building size and characteristics that are uh, being considered in the zoning amendment. Uh, if they were to propose a smaller building, then technically they, they would be able to operate. Um, Madam Mayor, it's uh, the agent here. May I speak? Sure. Um, I just wanted to go over just a few other things that some of the, the neighbors had comments on. Um, and Sarah can add to this or correct me if I'm wrong, but I do believe that sort of the next steps in the site plan agreement um, are speak to providing uh, off street parking. So one of the things that we've taken into consideration um, when we were designing the site plan was sufficient parking for the two um, employees that currently work for this business. So there's no um, on street parking. Um, the second thing is they receive one delivery a month of materials. As I said, this isn't a large factory. This isn't, you know, they're not pumping out, um, you know, a huge amount of material. These are really beautiful custom pieces that take a long time to build. Um, so they get one delivery a month and that is all. Okay. Um, Councilor, I'm just a comment here. about the noise. I, I mean, the ICF building will greatly reduce any noise that escapes that building. They're they're a fantastic foundation. In your view, since you know more about it than any of the rest of us, will it enough that the neighbors won't be able to come back and say, you know what? It, it all involves a whole bunch of things. I mean, doors and windows are very important. If you have a good insulated door, it reduces the uh, impact to your neighbor too. And, and the windows, if they're good windows, they'll reduce the noise escaping the building as well. So I think it's important that you make sure that the building is built properly to reduce the noise that escapes it. And I think that's probably what they're doing with this ICF. I think that's a reasonable idea. And we have to remember that this does almost exactly conform to our zoning bylaw. We're just discussing because it is the building small enough to be a home occupied business. So that, Okay, um, have we any more comments? And if not, we will move on to the next. I'll just give, I see that Jeff Wolicott is still on the line and I'm just giving you one last opportunity to make an oral presentation.
We can move on. Okay. Um, we're going to now get a motion to reconvene the regular meeting, please. Deputy Mayor Windover and and <laughs> that guy. Councillor Lambshead. All in favor, motion has carried. Now, business arising from a statutory public meeting. Sarah, would you like to speak to this, please? Thank you through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, there was a public meeting held for file number 22-23. At this time, staff are recommending that council receives the report from the external planning consultant, Chris Jones, and that direction be given to one, prepare a zoning bylaw amendment to authorize the proposed home industry in the manner requested by the applicant, and two, bring the zoning bylaw amendment back to council for consideration once the applicant has entered into a site plan agreement with the municipality. Thank you. Okay, can uh, is somebody prepared to make that motion? I, I would make this motion, but could we have a, an additional request that we get some information on the insulation in the doors and windows? I don't know if that's possible. But... Through you, Madam Mayor, I believe that would be possible to provide some details in the site plan agreement. I just want to make council aware that site plan agreements are now um, approved by the chief building official, director of planning and building services. So council won't see that site plan agreement. However, um, we could make an exception and allow council to review the document. You have no approval authority. It's up to the director of planning and building services to approve it, but we can certainly share that uh, draft agreement with you if council so desires. And that would be my desire okay. on that motion. Okay. So do we have a seconder on that motion? Deputy Mayor Windover, all in favor? Uh, record yes. vote, please. Okay. Are we ready for the vote? Councillor Franzen, are you in favor? No. Councillor Lamson? Yes. Deputy Mayor Wendover? Yes. Councillor Armstrong? No. Mayor Clarkson? Yes, if these provisions are yes. satisfactory. That is carried. I'd just like to make one additional comment. I realize the vote's been taken, but uh, if, if this was in the subdivision that I live in and I approved it, I'd have to move. Well, hopefully your house is high enough, but we justify the move. <laughs> <laughs> I had people complaining when I was uh, loading my truck in the morning when I went to work. They said, can't you do it at night? But com common sense has to enter into this. This is why we allowed home industries in the first place. So yeah. if we if it can be satisfied, like you've either you've either got to say we have them or we don't. And if we yeah, do and they meet everything that they have to meet. But you live in a subdivision, you're expecting that it be a residential area. I I I, I won't call anything further. Okay, so right. we'll now have a presentation from Jeffrey McIntosh, Assistant Vice President, Public Sector uh, Aon, regarding municipal insurance market update. Please unmute yes. your audio and share your camera and make your presentation. You will have 20 minutes. And then we'll ask council to save their uh, questions to the end, please. Well, good afternoon, Madam Mayor and uh, the rest of council. Thank you for having me today. Um, nice to see you all again. It looks like you're back in the office, which is nice, uh, as opposed to last year when we were all kind of sitting at home. Um, so I just wanted to discuss the municipal insurance market. Um, unfortunately, you know, not much has changed since I was here last. It is still a very tough market, and um, we're doing our best as a company to try and um, bring savings to the municipality where we can, um, and also, you know, new risk management strategies and techniques to ensure that your claims are low, which in the future should allow lower premiums as well. Uh, next slide, please. So just a little update on the insurance market. Um, the pricing has moderated a bit. Um, so last time I was here, I was discussing, you know, liability and excess liability and how they were very expensive. They still are expensive, but they're not um, increasing at a, at a rate at, at what we were seeing last year. So that, that's a good thing. 
unfortunately, um, the cyber market for municipalities is still very um, uh, hard, I would say. There's a lot of cyber attacks occurring and municipalities like yourselves are usually a, a target of these. Um, one reason for this is that, you know, some, some municipalities have legacy systems or older technologies in place. Luckily for um, you at Trent Lakes, you have just upgraded your systems um, to the newest technology available. So that should, you know, hopefully ward off some potential hackers. Um, and it's a good investment for your municipality to make in order to uh, protect your citizens' uh, information and privacy. Um, we really, we really still need underwriting information. You know, back in the day, we could, just, you know, just say what's your population and you know get you a quote. But nowadays, we really have to look at um, your municipalities as a as a whole and and an individual risk. Um, so it really takes a lot to get a renewal quote nowadays. Um, so it's it's a really a matter of us working with your staff to ensure that we're getting all the information in a timely manner, um, which they have done and been a great partner with us. Um, and that allows us to get to get the best um, possible quotes available for you. Uh, another thing we're seeing is that deductibles and retentions have been increasing. Um, basically, insurers want to see more skin in the game from uh, insureds. Basically, saying that you know we want to see that you know if 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 you have twenty five thousand or fifty thousand as a deductible, it might make you a little bit more aware of your risk management policies and procedures because you do have more skin in the game. Um, and basically, retentions and deductibles are just like your auto insurance, where that's the amount that you or the municipality have to pay before the insurance kicks in um, to take over the rest. Again, cyber attacks are increasing. Um, public institutions are, are targets of these. Uh, and another thing is uh, new exclusions for communicable diseases. So obviously because of COVID, um, a lot of policies didn't have explicit wordings or exclusions that, that denied claims. Um, right now, a lot of those lawsuits are in the court um, to determine whether or not they will be paid out. But due to this, a lot of the um, insurance companies have been adding um, this exclusion so that if it does occur in the future, um, they will have that inclusion exclusion uh, on their policy right from the get-go. Next slide, please. So here we have your um, premiums from this past year and this year. Um, so you will see that there was a 13.9% increase. Um, I would consider this average for our other municipalities uh, um, of your size. Um, unfortunately, if you if you look, you'll see again, liability has increased by 70% and the cyber breach response has increased by 35%. Um, the one thing I'll say about the cyber and breach um, insurance is that um, a lot of cities, towns, municipalities can actually get this cover. Um, it's very hard to get. Insurers don't wanna write it. And if they do write it, they're gonna charge you know a, a large amount for it. Uh, so I, I do think 35% there and the fact that you do have coverage for that is a win. Um, again, because you have been upgrading your systems and we were working with your staff to ensure that the insurer knows what you did to it, what upgrades were made, um, how that'll affect you in the future. Um, so I think the 35% is, is on the very low end of an increase for municipality of your size at this time. Um, there's been some other small uh, increases to automobiles and property, and those are mainly due to um, an increase in property values and also an increase in um, vehicles. Next slide, please. So we've been working with the municipality over the past couple of years to, to try and stabilize the pricing. Um, so the key to this is risk management. We want to you know, lower the frequency and severity of claims. Um, this is basically what underwriters look at when they decide how to price um, insurance policies for municipalities. They look at how many claims you've had and what's the price of them. Unfortunately, a lot of these claims um, take years and years to develop um, and they do ask for 10-year loss runs so that they can see what has been occurring not just you know in the last couple of years but in a, in a larger time period um, and key to this is that you have to have proper record keeping data collection um, right from this, the, the get-go so at the very start of an initial claim or statement of claim you want to collect all that information right away so that you do have that um, you know in your desk that if, if, you, if it does go to court you know five ten years down the road you have the best available information available to you to totally fight that claim and show that there was no negligence on the part of the municipality again up-to-date and comprehensive underwriting information this is very much needed um, we like to start a renewal process about four months in advance so we contact um, staff at the municipality and start sending them a list of things that we'll need um, that way, we gives us a lot of time to then negotiate with the underwriters to ensure that we're getting the best deal possible. Um, and if there are any other questions or um, you know information that is needed, there's sufficient time to get that get that back from staff and get that to the underwriters. 
Other things that we're looking at is other maybe untraditional markets for um, municipalities. So we're looking at reinsurance markets. We're looking at Lloyd's of London, which is the largest um, insurance conglomerate in the world. Um, and also just any other options that are available in the marketplace to, to hopefully better serve our municipal clients. Um, so we're constantly looking for new new insurers, um, you know, new ways to manage risk, and also ensuring that you know your deductibles, retentions are all in the right spots, that you are getting the best bang for your buck in terms of your insurance policies. Next slide, please. So again, just coming back to cyber insurance for a bit, um, it's very hard to place. Attacks are increasing. Um, not only are tax increasing, but you know settlement and ransom costs are also increasing. Uh, this is usually you know due to employee actions where they click on a, a wrong link, or we've seen some other municipalities where they've actually sent um, payments out to, to due to invoices that have come in that looked you know very similar to um, vendors that they use, but actually were sent off to other bank accounts. So the key to the, the key to this is obviously having the right systems in place to ensure that this can't happen, but also to have training with your employees to ensure that they are understanding that you know. Um, the right protocols have to be followed. You know, you have to ensure that you're calling that second person. You can't just get an email and send out the, the payment right away. You know, there should be a, a callback or other steps, uh, you know, to kind of break the chain in case that were to be coming from a, a fraudulent source. Um, again, underwriters are more willing to write it when the right controls are in place, like like you have here. So that's a, um, a very good thing that you guys decided to, to um, invest in your technology. Um, and that will ensure that your cyber policy will be in place this year, but also well into the future as well. Next slide, please. So some of the other things that we're doing here, um, one of the benefits of our program is that we have a, um, a helpline called the Muni Assist Helpline. And basically what that is, is a, it's a, a telephone or email address where you can call um, a lawyer from Miller Thompson, um, and they will talk you through any you know, situations um, that might arise from a legal standpoint whether that might be something about a claim or whether it might be something about, you know, what kind of notice should be posted at a hockey arena or, um, you know, signage, things like that. And so we've been really working with the staff and Miller Thompson to ensure that these types of things are um, being identified and then rectified when we can. So one of the things that we've been working on the past couple of years is the volunteer management policy. So basically ensuring that we have a policy in place um, for that when volunteers are hired, whether it be at a fair or a parade, um, that there are protocols in place to ensure that they understand their roles and responsibilities, and also to ensure that the city or the municipality is protecting themselves in terms of, you know, getting the right sign-offs, having the right waiver signed, um, ensuring that there's, you know, maybe police checks placed, um, people are of age, things like that to ensure that um, both the volunteers are safe, municipalities covered, and that the general public is, um, identified as being safe as well. Um, again, we've, we've discussed a bit about the hall rental and event policy. Um, so we're ensuring that um, people that do rent your halls are having insurance placed somewhere so that we can, um, if there are a claim that happens that, you know, it'll respond to their insurance first before being set up on the municipality. Um, and also just ensuring that, you know, people that are renting halls should also be looking out for things that might be uh, hazardous to the public or to the people that are attending those events. So, you know, if there's a leak in the roof and it's causing a puddle, you know, those things should be identified to, to staff ASAP to ensure that people aren't slipping and falling and, and causing a lawsuit against either the party or the municipality. Uh, another thing was the um, the ice pad. Um, so there was there's a bunch of volunteers um, that maintain that ice pad. Um, and we just kind of put some rules and protocols in, into place to ensure that, um, you know, everyone's on the same page as to who can do what, what's, what's expected out of the people that are volunteering there, kind of what are the rules of the ice, what can be done on the ice, when it can be done, um, and things like that so that, you know, you would like to think that, you know, people will do this stuff automatically without having to be told, but having those policies and procedures in place can offer you some protection in case a lawsuit were to occur to show that you are taking steps to ensure the safety of the, of the, the patrons of the, the arena or the ice pad, I should say. Um, and so just having those written down and having actual policies goes a long way towards protecting the municipality. Next slide, please. So this is just a little blurb about Aon. Um, we are, um, you know, we are an insurance broker, but we like to think that we're in the business of better decisions. So we're not just here to place your insurance policies. We're here to discuss things about, you know, risk management or, you know, maybe some outside the box ways of thinking about risk. 
um, but we're not just here to place insurance policies. Um, we're here to help you make your decisions to help um, you know, lower your cost at the municipality, but also to make sure that um, the community is safe and that your staff and volunteers are safe as well. Next slide, please. So that's pretty much it. Uh, you can go to the next slide as well. There's my contact information there. Um, mm -hmm. I do I do appreciate you um, having the, taking the time to have me here. Um, I hopefully we'll be able to come up and visit staff in the near future as well to um, discuss face to face as we haven't had a meeting face to face in a while. But I do appreciate your business. Um, we thank you for it, and we look forward to serving you uh, both now and in the future as well. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, council or staff if you have any questions. Okay, I have a couple. Carol had the question. Sorry, Carol. That's okay. Um, thank you. It's you, Madam Mayor. I have two questions. Um, the first one is you mentioned that deductibles are going up, um, and I wonder what the specific impact was on Trent Lakes of that trend. So I believe um, when we first came on um, with the municipality, I believe your deductibles were at you know either ten or twenty-five thousand, and I believe they're now up to fifty thousand. I, I do have to double check to ensure the exact number, but I believe they have a you know, fairly reasonable amount. And again, this is not something that's just for your municipality. Um, most insurers won't, like back in the day, you could get, you could get a $2,500 deductible or a $1,000 deductible, but um, that's no longer possible. And insurers are just not willing to offer that. They don't want to have those costs at that lower level. Um, so now, you know, the lowest deductibles I'm seeing, um, even for very small communities, are, you know, 10 or 20,000. Thank you. And the uh, second question, um, you mentioned exclusions for communicable diseases. I don't exactly understand what that exclusion is. So if you can just give us a brief overview of what that means. Uh, I certainly, certainly, certainly. Um, so I guess when uh, COVID-19 happened, there was no specific language in these policies to say, you know, if someone were to, let's say, catch COVID at a, a municipal event, um, could they sue the city and say that, you know, it was part of the, the reason they caught COVID was because they were at um, a city or municipal run event and there maybe they weren't the right protocols in place. Um, maybe there was no masking or no hand sanitizer, anything like that. And there was negligence on the part of the city. Um, then this exclusion would no, would ensure that there's no coverage um, from, the, from the insurance company in this case. Um, but that being said, you know, we didn't really, we don't, we haven't seen a lot of claims to do with COVID um, because it is very hard to prove that, you know, someone caught it at this per this place versus that place. But insurance companies are very conservative and they would like to, um, you know, put it in their policies straight away to ensure that it, it it's very explicitly in there being said that, you know, we will not cover this. But that being said, I have not seen any claims that have occurred um, at the municipal level regarding COVID um, for the past two or three years. And if I may just follow up, sorry to you, Madam Mayor. So does that, again, specifically for Trent Lakes, um, do we have any uh, communicable disease coverage or are we also excluded from that by uh, our insurer? So it, you would be excluded because it, it, it's not just of COVID, it's communicable diseases. Um, you, we can buy that back um, at the additional policy, but it is quite expensive. Um, and I haven't seen any other municipal clients um, purchasing that in the in the past or, or in this recent term as well. Thank you. Okay, I have a couple of questions. Uh, with the insurance rates doing what they are, it's it's fine to say, well, you know, you're 30% or whatever you are, and that's that's a, that's a good thing, but it's not a good thing because it's not sustainable. So what what are the insurance uh, businesses doing to make the pool bigger? Uh, like our municipalities, can you know, can we join up with three or four other ones so that we, we're in a position to be able to, to spread our, um, our liability uh, further? Uh, it also is problematic for me, and this may not be part of your insurance policy at all, that counselors are not covered by the liability or anything that, that staff are. And I think counselors today who uh, go into this business uh, can be shocked to find out just how, uh, how vulnerable we really are. So I'd like you to comment on both of those because uh, sustainability um, is huge. Uh, the city of Toronto and some of these other areas, they self-insure. Mm -hmm. uh, 
you look at the rural municipalities, we have very easily enough people to be able to self-insure. So going forward, there's got to be more innovative ways of handling this. Uh, last two, you know, what is it to call it? So last and several liability. Uh, lobbying effectively for that because that's one of our major uh, drivers. Uh, it hits us hard and obviously, you know, you, you charge according to what happens, but we're the ones who end up paying that paying that bill. So those are my, my little bundle of questions. <laughs> sure, so uh, thank you. So um, it's hard to say whether or not bundling with other municipalities um, would be any, would be beneficial. We look at every risk, you know, um, on its own merit. And, you know, it's one thing I would say about Trend Lakes is that you do have a, a good and improving claims history. And to be bundled with another community that might not be as positive or you know, might not have the same controls in place that, that you do might not be the best idea just because you don't have control over um, what another community is doing, whereas you have control over what you're doing. Um, there are some talks about, um, years ago there was a, a, a reciprocal called OMEX, where basically you that you'd pay money into a fund, and then at the end of the year, the claims would then be paid via that fund. Um, the only issue there was that there was large retroactive payments that were occurring because they were not collecting enough premium up front, and they would have to go back to its members afterwards. So that's that's the kind of thing with the traditional insurance market that's nice is that you know if there are you know if you do have a large claim and it does go let's say twenty million dollars you're not on the hook for it by self-insuring that is all gone to the insurance company and they are responsible for paying all that. Um, that being said, I think there is um, a fine balance between self-insuring and you know having a, a low retention. So um, we deal with some large clients that have you know one million, two million dollar retentions, um, and that allows them to then control everything that's going on below that level. That being said, though, you do have to have the staff and know-how in order to be able to manage all that information that or all those claims that are below the retention level. Um, what we try to do is ensure that you know the retention is right for the for the client based upon about based upon the amount of claims they have the staff that's available uh, and the pricing of course so you know in your case uh, i you don't you don't have a, a dedicated risk manager um so it, it might not make sense to put the retention that high but that is that is always something we can look at too, just give you some options as to, you know, at this retention level, it's this price, at this retention level, it's that price, just so you have an idea of what the price um, savings might be. Um, what we are looking at though is, you know, joint several liability is a very hot topic, but in terms of actually causing premiums to go down, um, I don't think that's the, the, the end all for causing lower insurance premiums for municipalities. What we'll have to see is that you know, there are some, in other jurisdictions, there are caps on liability. So, you know, a, a, a municipality might only, be, um, might only be on the hook for $5 million of a, of a lawsuit and the rest is, you know, given out by the federal government or provincial government or it's not awarded by the courts at all. So that's something that we have been talking to regulators about because that would not, that would then allow municipalities to not have to buy, you know, the full 45 or $50 million worth of, worth of liability tower. Um, they would just have to buy the $5 million and that would give you some cost savings as well. Um, there have been some large claims in Ontario um, and other jurisdictions, including transit losses, um, you know, bus accidents, things like that, that have caused um, insurers to kind of get cold feet um, in the Ontario marketplace. Um, but it's just hard to, it's, it's hard to say if there's one thing that could be done to improve this. Um, in all honesty, this is a hard insurance market. It happens on a cyclical basis. Um, if you do remember when we came on risk, I believe we were able to slash the rates by 25 to 30%. And I believe that will happen again in the future once the market softens and there is more competition available in the marketplace. Right now, there are just very few insurers willing to write Canadian municipal risks. And due to that, the pricing is high. They're, they know they can charge it and they know that you have to buy it. So it's a very rough position. And that's why we're constantly looking and, and, and looking through the market to ensure that every single insurance uh, company that is willing to, to, to write a risk like yours, we're talking to. We wanna see if we can get a price out of them. We wanna see if they'll you know, maybe expand their cover to, to do this type of um, industry. Because 
the capacity is very low right now, and that is driving the price uh, extremely high and continuing to do so. But like I said, we have seen signs of it softening, and so I expect over the next year or two to see um, you know rates coming down as opposed to going up like this. Thank you. Anybody else? My comment was about joint and severable liability there. We're, we're planning on making a presentation at the AMO to that minister. So hopefully you are all doing the same. <clears throat> if I may, we have been um, giving uh, data and information from our claim systems um, to municipalities that are, that are looking to um, do that at AMO. Um, so if there is any information or, or um, help that you need for your presentation at AMO, please feel free to reach out to me and I can help in any way possible. Okay. Okay. So you didn't have a comment on uh, on uh, insurance for elected officials. That's another that's another thing. Uh, so if I may, we do have um, counselors are afforded coverage for um, accident and disability and things like that. But in terms of um, you know for the decisions you make, that is something that is not covered under the insurance policies. The as a the, the the named insured under your policies is very broad so you do have coverage for um you know all employees all members of boards council uh, men and women but in terms of having coverage for decisions that are made by council um that is not something that's offered um that i've seen in ontario for any council members at all okay have we any other questions and if not Thank you very much for your for your time and presentation. And uh, Donna, I'm sure you really like this. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's sitting over there chewing her nails, and she doesn't even choose her nails. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate your time and uh, your business, and I look forward to to seeing you all in person, hopefully very soon. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Now, can we have a motion to uh, receive this delegation, please? Okay, Councillor Armstrong, Councillor Lambshead, all in favor? The motion is carried. Now, we have another delegation by uh, Bob Taylor Vasey, Chair of Parks, Recreation and Culture, regarding 10.7.3 Committee and Board Structure Review. Please unmute your audio and share your camera, make your presentation. You will have 10 minutes. Thank you, sir. Uh, can you hear me all right? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> well, thank you, Madam Mayor, and good afternoon to members of council, staff, and the virtual gallery. So, next slide. Um, on August the 2nd, the council agenda was published with one item of particular interest to the members of PRCAC, the uh, Committee and Board Structure Policy Review. <clears throat> so this afternoon, we will present two recommendations on this item. Uh, obviously be dealt uh, with later on uh, as agenda item 10.7.3. One recommends the continuation of the existing PRCAC until Q1 2023, and the second speaks to the proposed Council 2023 Strategic Priorities Review. Next slide. It's useful to clarify the scope of our review. It reflects the opinions of the public representatives, on the Park Recreation Culture Advisory Committee, and it is a summary of an official response submitted yesterday. And we did not feel that it was within our mandate to speak to other boards, uh, about other boards or committees, except indirectly. I would note that in discussions with Chair uh, Dave Reed of, e of EDAC, um, he endorses our recommendations in principle. <clears throat> And our recommendations on future potential terms of reference and mandate composition for PRCAC will be brought to council in September. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, it is the recommendations of the Parks, Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee, not council, uh, the public representatives that I can read them in their entirety. One, the term of the existing advisory committee be extended until such point as the strategic directions of the municipality have been determined by council, infrastructure changes identified as needed for a new PRCAC and public notice has been issued for new members for the next term of council. And second, the chair of the existing PRCAC or his designate be included in the strategic review process 
to bring uh, the unique perspective that the committee can to that discussion. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, on this slide, we identified four components of the report that have a direct impact on PRCAC. Uh, one, to, de to defer a decision on the structure of that committee until the new term of council. Uh, the current appointments to uh, uh, to the Parks, Rec and Culture Advisory Committee expire as of the, the end of the current term. That the posting of vacancies uh, be postponed until after the strategic review period is over and which has been targeted for the spring of 2023. And also finally that if council approved the continuation of PRC after January the 14th as it is, the posting of vacancies would proceed immediately after the election. Uh, this is normal protocol. It would also conceivably, uh, the new PRCAC be composed of a majority of, of new members. Next slide. And on this slide, we identify a council initiative that seemed, seems to have an indirect impact on advisory committees in general, but in reality is quite direct. And that is that in, in addition, the newly elected council will complete a strategic planning exercise to establish municipality strategic direction for the upcoming term. Next slide. Uh, PRCAC has the following responses to these five options before council. First, we agree without hesitation that their terms of reference of PRCAC must be aligned with the strategic priorities established by council for the next term. Next slide. However, under the rubric, the overall rubric of the future of PRCAC after November the 14th, 2022, we question the wisdom of recommendations two, three, and four for five reasons. Underlying all of this is our position that continuity is essential. One, PRCAC initiatives that are ongoing will not be completed by November the 14th. They are the Open Spaces Master Plan, the PRC project to propose a community hub infrastructure in Trent Lakes, and the PRCAC project to identify all our cover records inside and outside of the municipality of relevance to our municipal heritage. Second, there would be up to a four and a half month potential delay in any progress in all in PRCAC, uh, PRCAC initiatives simply because the committee would not be a functioning entity. This would not diminish the role of PRCAC, but it would eliminate it at a critical juncture in these initiatives. Three, third, with respect to open spaces, the inability of residents through PRCAC to respond to drafts of the open spaces master plan, which is a fundamental purpose and mandate of the advisory committee <clears throat> since 2019. Fourth, with respect to community hubs, the need for collaboration with the Buckhorn Community Center as it implements its own strategic plan of which community hubs is a priority element. And fifth and finally, with respect to preservation of municipal heritage, the fact that we are losing time and potentially face the, uh, the inadvertent destruction of records that should be preserved and conserved. <clears throat> Next slide. <clears throat> our last response <clears throat> is the proposed strategic priorities review by council. And our recommendation is a critical amendment to that recommendation, the involvement of PRCAC, if not EDAC, in discussions of this strategic nature. There are three components in our opinion to this review. Council, whose priorities will govern everything over the next municipal term of office, staff who bring to bear key data and information helping to direct council in its deliberations and advisory committees. Advisory committees were constituted for a reason and it is that advisory role that we argue needs to continue in these strategic discussions to bridge two terms. And with respect to PRCAC, our advisory committee brings one, a four-year track record of strategic planning, discipline project management, and the benefits of community input, and in addition to a sense of what is needed 2023 and beyond, including composition of the committee, recruitment of members, <clears throat> mandate, 
and real estate terms of reference and work plan development. Next slide. So just to repeat the two recommendations, one that the term of the existing advisory committee be extended until such point as, it, as the strategic directions of the municipality have been determined by council, infrastructure change is identified as needed for a new PRC, AC, and public notice has been issued for new members for the next term of council, and that the chair of the existing PRCAC or his designate or designates be included in the strategic review process to bring the unique perspective that the committee can to that discussion. Next slide. And this concludes our deputation. We encourage council to support our recommendations. Thank you very much. Okay, do we have questions? Yeah, we have questions. Council Lambshead. More of a comment. I, I think the con continuity of these uh, committees is important. I think there's a lot of things in play here right now. And I think that it should be continued through till the next council strategic priorities, which may align with what we're doing and may not. But it, it's just if we lose four or five months of process, then we never get that back. Anybody else? Uh, yeah, just make a comment. Uh, I, I agree with Councillor Lambshead and uh, uh, an open space plan is going to be reported on. Or so I think it's important that uh, somebody that's been working on this file all the way along be available. Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I would concur with, with those points. I think the, uh, the continuity uh, when we have a council turnover i see no downside to it <laughs> it's frankly the point i see a few positives but i don't see any downside to doing that I, I i very much doubt realistically that the committee will complete their work uh, or make much progress on the community hubs and cultural resource uh, asset mapping um, in, in the time between november 14th and probably first quarter however i do think the open space is something that that is in progress, and we would want to get feedback uh, and input from the PRCAC on that to the next council. So generally, I support that. I'm I'm not so sure about including the PRCAC chair or designate in the strategic priority session. I think we need to understand a little bit more about what that process looks like and how it will be conducted. Um, I'm open to it, but um, you know, not ready to say yes to that one today. Uh, but certainly in terms of continuity or continuation of the committee, that, that makes sense to me. I just see no no negatives to it. I, I have a comment about giving the specific, um, I wouldn't say power because that's not, that's not what I'm trying to say, but to the uh, community center. Because the community center is a private entity and they do get support from the, from the council. But in, firm, in terms of a community hub, a community hub needs to be owned by the municipality. And one of the major drawbacks that we've had in terms of working with the, uh, the rink as it stands is people saying, well, it's on community center property, therefore it is, it is unique. So I think in order to, to give, say, the community hub, the community center, I think it's a name that's being thrown out there a lot, but the actual value of a hub and what a hub means is much more than what the community center can bring to this to this discussion. So should they be included in discussions? Uh, yes, should they drive those discussions or be the center of those discussions? I totally disagree with that. We've been held up now for months and months and months in terms of getting as far as we have. Um, I think any particular group, whether it's Parks and Rec or whatever it happens to be, I don't think any particular group should have that kind of, of uh, uh, responsibility when they're not under the umbrella of the uh, of the township. Uh, uh, Madam Mayor, can I respond to that comment, please? Absolutely. <laughs> I thought uh, you would. <laughs> uh, there's no. Um, I, I think. The whole the whole concept of community hubs, and of course the, the stewardship community hub in the province is 
is the mount in Piero. Um, the whole concept of CUNY hubs is very complicated and it is based on not on someone taking ownership but on uh, people being collaborative. So I don't um, uh, I don't suggest that BCC is going to drive the bus. I just think that they got to be a passenger on it. Um, and it's best if uh, those of us, for example, PRCAC, that are, are working the issue of community hubs uh, have a partnership with BCC that is is mutually beneficial to both municipality and uh, to BCC. I'm not, I, I, I agree with you that the, the community hub Whoever that comes comes out to be, may very well be a municipal process that does not divorce it from being part of a bigger whole of which BCC is a part, in my opinion. Okay. Is everybody okay with this? So we need now um, we need a motion to accept this uh, presentation. I motion think. to receive. Mm -hmm. to receive. Councilor Armstrong and Deputy Mayor Wendover. All in favor. Motion is carried. Staff reports, I don't see any. Recreation of facilities, fire and emergency, building and planning. Barb Walden, Director of Building and Planning, Cloud Print. Uh, permit program for planning, please. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, I'm actually going to let Sarah speak to this. Uh, she wrote the report. She did the background on it. Uh, so I'm going to let her speak to it, and then I'll answer any additional questions. Thank you, through you, uh, Madam Mayor. Um, so on today's agenda, there's a report to Council uh, concerning the adoption of the Cloud Permit Planning Module for the Municipality of Trent Lakes. Um, so I've been in... Uh, meetings with the County of Peterborough, the cloud permitting staff, and other lower tier municipalities within the county monthly to discuss common questions, address shared concerns, and, uh, and get an idea of how the system looks in its preliminary phases. Uh, planning staff will continue to meet monthly if the system is implemented with Trent Lakes um, to share our experience with other municipalities within the county and to provide input from staff directly to cloud permitting staff to make the system more accessible and tailored to our specific needs. Um, cloud permit promotes a or proposes a streamlined electronic management service that is built around the policies and legislation of the Ontario Planning Act. Um, the program is built around our two-tiered system, so this allows for shared access between the county and the municipality on more complex files such as plans of subdivision. Uh, as this program introduces a shared workspace platform, everything will be accessible on all ends of the uh, quote-unquote electronic table. Uh, the planning module corresponds to the building module, um, which was implemented in the municipality in 2020. This will bridge the gap between building and planning applications as permits that require additional planning approval can be immediately referred to planning staff on the same platform the permit will come from. Uh, this will allow for a more straightforward experience for all staff and applicants. Adoption of this system prior to the implement implementation of Bill 109 in 2023 will be a crucial part of the planning module's success in Trent Lakes, as staff will need adequate time to train and fine-tune the pre-consultation process to ensure a seamless protocol in the year 2023. Uh, the municipality is uh, a funded partner, so during the five-year term, the municipality is expected to pay a $1,750 first-year licensing fee, in addition to a cost-share portion of $2,625 for an implementation fee. Uh, the municipality's cost from this cost share portion is based on the number of participants. So uh, this can range from 375 to 875, as outlined in the appendix. Uh, for the next four years following, uh, the municipality will need to budget a cost of $5,000 per year for the annual subscription. It is recommended that council receives the report from the di director of planning and building chief building official regarding the cloud permit program for planning and further that council directs staff to proceed with the purchase of the cloud permit planning module on an ongoing basis. Thank you. Okay, do we have questions? 
Councillor Armstrong. Thank you, Chief Manager. Um, thank you very much, Sarah and Barb. Pleased that we are moving forward and in, into the digital world and, and improving our processes by uh, computerizing them. Uh, I do have one. It's a very nitty question, so I apologize. But do we have um, Peterborough Public Health and the Conservation Authority on board with using this uh, uh, cloud permit system? Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to you, uh, Councillor Armstrong, um, I have been in contact with Peterborough Public Health um, as well as the Conservation Authority. They did express interest in the program and commenting on the program. Uh, and being as the whole county um, is adopting this system, it's uh, it's going to become a more uh, uh, common uh, platform for the municipalities and, and the subsequent uh, agencies to use and comment on. It's a more convenient system because everybody will have access to everything. Um, so I imagine if they're not going to immediately get involved with the cloud permitting system, uh, they will in the near future. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, I can add on to that. Uh, cloud permit has become pretty much, sorry, Matt's talking in, on the phone in the background, I apologize. Um, it's become pretty much the main program that most building departments and planning departments are, especially building departments have implemented across the province. The planning departments are now catching up. Um, I'm pretty excited about these two merging together uh, because there's been a big hole um, when I when I review an application and if I flag um, some issues with planning and I defer it back to planning, there's no real mechanism on the cloud right now that alerts me when the planning has been looked after. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping that when they merge together, that's going to streamline and make things much easier. Um, so I'm pretty excited about this. Yes, Peter. I'd like to make a motion that we that the we, uh, that uh, we accept this uh, and uh, uh, that we use the recommended motion. Uh, and I'd like to speak to the motion as well. Uh, I'm surprised that it's taken this long to come forward because we've been dealing with this, I think, for at least four, at least four years. Is this going to help the uh, the backlog between the municipality and the county? Barb, can you speak to that? Through you, Mary Clarkson, when you're saying backlog, can you well, like give me a little bit more? Yeah, like if, if something from here goes to the county that the county has to make an approval on, and there's something that they're missing, uh, will it expedite them getting back and getting that as opposed to sitting there for who knows how long until they get around to it? Like, will it make that communication quicker? It will, as long as all the parties are on board. So this is one thing that I've learned through the building permit module as I've been going along and learning how to streamline it and make it work better um, is you have to make sure that the parties are all involved. So for example, every time I open up a building permit application and I start reviewing, the very first thing I do is I invite myself as a party and I list myself as an other consultant. So what that does is if anybody uh, sends a message through their porthole, it alerts me via email. So when there are applications, planning applications that involve the municipality and the county, uh, the same process would take place. As long as all the parties are on the application, then any time there is messaging going back and forth, they would be alerted through emails. So it should. Do you have, do you have uh, confidence that the county is... Uh is capable or willing to uh, to be as involved in this as they need to be in order for this thing to be successful? I think that it's going to take some time for everybody to learn it, I'll be honest. Um, it will be a year for me, I believe, next week with Trent Lakes, um, and it has taken me a year to feel pretty comfortable with the program. Um, it is not an easy program to pick up right off the bat unless you're really young and savvy. So maybe they maybe they will be okay, um, <laughs> but it does take some time to learn, and I think it's just a matter of the municipalities working with the county and making sure that at least from our end that we are reaching out to them and and making sure that it is running smoothly. So those will be kind of the hiccups at the beginning of the process, but I I have um, 
I have no fear that it will work all together well, just like the GIS program, it's kind of similar. Okay, uh, does anybody want to uh, second uh, Councillor Franzen's motion? Deputy Mayor Windower, all in favor? Uh, yes, I'd Carol? like to make a comment. Yes, um, through Matter, just building on on the Mayor's comment, I think I think what we have to remember is that this is a tool, and it just facilitates a process of collaboration between the county and municipalities. And I think until we have some sorts of understanding and agreements around what timeframes are for responding, this tool is not going to change that. <laughs> no, I it may prompt discussions around that, and there should be discussions around it, because, and I could be wrong, but I don't think there are any standards or expectations around what response time is when somebody gets a notification that they need to provide information. So I, this can help us get a better process in place, but again, it's only a tool. And through you, Mayor Clarkson, I, I totally agree with what Councillor, uh, she, what she just stated, because, um, you know, we can't control people at the county at their end um, doing, you know, meeting their timelines or, you know, deciding that they're going to do their report at the end of the, the timeline. We can't control that part of it. I guess the point I was trying to make is that the communication between the parties should improve. And that's something that um, I intend to try to make better. And I think that that's just you know, meeting with the county and having these conversations and saying, okay, what's working at your end? What's not working? Let's figure this out and just get the communication part of it going. With anything, if communication is working better, then everything else should improve. Now, the this uh, Ontario government um, ruling that they're supposedly coming out with, where isn't that there a certain period of time that these things must be must be processed will that put some more teeth in this will it be like is it one of those things that can help that or is that whole expectation uh, not realistic uh well that's that's two different topics to be honest um yes this will help a little bit because it will keep things a bit more organized and it will connect building to planning and and planning to county planning and so forth but it still comes down to the applicant making complete applications and giving us the information we need at, at the front end. That's always been the problem. Um, we just have to be a bit more strict on, okay, this is what we are going to accept as a complete application. <coughs> the province has made it diff more difficult for planning departments, absolutely. Um, and Again, it's just a matter of us um, or letting the public know this is what has to be on a complete application. If this is not received, the application is not complete. The clock doesn't start ticking until the application is complete. In in your in your uh, educated view, Barb, are there reasons why so many applications come in incomplete? Is it because staff doesn't have the time to explain it, as they don't feel it's their responsibility to explain it? Um, I guess when I see myself coming up to the desk, I see myself coming up to the desk with somebody who has qualifications in planning and zoning and all the rest of these things, and I see myself with nothing, sort of saying, okay, where do I go from here? So I know the pre-approval uh, pre is certainly helping with that, but has that gone, has it gone far enough? Well, through you, Mayor Clarkson, I'll be honest, there's kind of two camps of people. So when Sarah is having a pre-consult meeting and she's dealing with professional planners or consultants like you, there was one on earlier, Holly, um, you know, she's really great to deal with because she understands what's required. She understands what needs to be on a site plan. Um, when you're dealing with the homeowner and you sit down with them on a pre-consult and they might hear some things they don't want to hear and instead of taking all the information in, they're focusing on, okay, you told me I can't do that. 
so that's kind of part of the problem is they start they get you know it's very personal for them and we understand that but we're we're telling them for example you need to give us a site plan you need to show us everything on the property you need to show us this you need to have your septic you need to have this you need to have that on it and probably eight times out of ten Sarah will get a site plan in and when she goes out to post the property she finds like three more buildings so you know maybe we just have to I think when I said we are going to be really strict about this is what a complete application is this is what a complete site plan is this is you know and give them very strict this is what it's going to be and if it's not received then it's not complete um, it's a matter of the owners not always listening to, to what they're being told. And I th think that Sarah is pretty good at following up with emails as well after those pre-consults um, to, to let them know what she's looking for and we still don't get it. So it's not always at this end of the table. Oh, I'm not, I'm not suggesting it is. I'm just suggesting that the expertise at this end is very different from the, uh, the person who goes to the counter who knows from nothing, who may have done something 20 years ago that doesn't even apply today. So it's the education end of it that, that is, uh, and you know, maybe there is no magic bullet for this. Maybe this is just something that you, that you struggle through when people aren't complete. But uh, I think the lack of, of um, not, not lack of, but I think the difference in the knowledge between one side of the count and the other side makes it very simple in one's view and makes it very complicated in the other one. Uh, through you, Mary Clark. So, so another element that we fight, and I, and I fight this in the billing department as well, is you know if you don't know how to do something, then you need to hire somebody who knows how to do it. So. You know, I can't tell you how many hours I spend marking drawings up and sending them back, and then they. Um, you know, instead of just hiring somebody who knows how to do it, the first time around saves everybody time and money. Um, they just continue to want to do it themselves. And planning is really complicated. Um, like, you know, if you don't understand all the legislation and you don't understand the Planning Act and you don't, under, you know, understand how to read an official plan and a zoning amendment, if all that overwhelms you, then you should be hiring somebody to work with you as a professional to help you through the process. And maybe that's a message that we can we can work on to get out there. But as you know, everything comes down to money and people like to do things themselves. But it's just like the dealing with a homeowner in a building permit. They're always more challenging to deal with than when you're dealing with a professional. It's no different in the planning world. So when you're dealing with a homeowner who wants to do the work themselves and you're continuously telling them that this isn't all the information we need, you need to do this, you need to do that, that's when things get bogged down. Okay. Well, we've got our motion. I think all we're doing now is looking for, for a vote, right? So all in favor? And the motion is carried. Thank you, Barb. Thank you. Okay, Adele, you're, you've got some additional residential units. Yes, thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, this report was prepared by Chris Jones, external planning consultant, in regard to addressing additional residential units and the preparation of zoning provisions in a site-specific zoning bylaw amendment in advance of the approval of the county official plan. Ultimately, once the county OP is approved, staff would be in a position to bring forward the zoning bylaw amendment. Once the county official plan is approved, the municipality zoning bylaw B2014-070 will require a comprehensive review and update, so it will be aligned with the policies in the new county OP. This comprehensive review will take some time. The Planning Act, Provincial policy and the new official plan contain policies which support secondary units or additional residential units, while currently the municipality's official plan and zoning bylaw does not support additional residential units on properties. Secondary units are an issue which is subject to frequent inquiries and pre-consultation discussions, therefore require more urgent attention. 
Therefore, it's being recommended that Council give direction to the Planning Department to research and coordinate the preparation of a planning report and draft zoning bylaw amendment to authorize as of right permissions and regulations for additional residential units in the municipality and report back to Council prior to scheduling a public meeting in accordance with the requirements of the Planning Act. And that concludes Chris's report, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Do I see hands? <coughs> Councillor Franzen. Uh, Adele, would this also deal with uh, uh, condos being built in our municipality or not? Um, I don't believe it would really deal with condos, but we would look at any kind of secondary units, whether it's within an existing detached dwelling or semi-detached dwelling or accessory structures. We're just trying to put in place some rules and regulations so when everything's approved, the Planning Act for a while has allowed people to um, or encouraged secondary units in our zoning and we just haven't brought forth any kind of regulations. So we'd like to just get a jump on it because the initial review of our current zoning bylaw is going to take up to a year to take a look at that bylaw and put in new provisions to align itself with provincial policy and the county OP. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Armstrong. Thank you. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, Adele, I, I think this is a good initiative. Clearly, this is something that's topical um, because of the focus uh, and attention on affordable housing. So I think that it's good for you to get started on this so that you're ready once the official plan gets approved, which is probably next year. Uh, the only ask I would have is that in preparing that, you do take as one of your pieces of input the uh, economic uh, strategy plan that is currently being um, prepared by our consultants who may or may not make some comments about affordable housing. Uh, but just ask that you include that in the uh, background research uh, and benchmarking that you're doing. But good initiative. Thank you, and through, Mayor, through you, Mayor Clarkson, we will certainly, within our research, look at any kind of recommendations coming out of any reports that the municipality is doing. Barb, what about people who have built uh, houses with these large garages beside them with, with uh, attics and whatever? Are they going to be able to, uh, uh, to apply to have those made legal if they do the septic and do all the rest of that stuff? Because so they're doing they're doing it anyway. <laughs> yes, through you, Mayor Clarkson, uh, we are actually finding quite a few of them out there right now that have been built without permits. Uh, I think the biggest stumbling block that people are going to run into is the ministry has given us a formal letter where they have stated very clearly that they will not be in support of any planning applications or secondary uh, suites on lakes that are already at capacity. Uh, they make a pretty good case for it because they have uh, very serious concerns about the environmental health of the lake with the addition of more people, more boats, more fuels and everything going into the water, more septics near the water, bigger septics near the water. So if you are on a lake that is already at capacity, you will not be able to have a secondary suite. Um, yeah, and I wasn't speaking about boat houses. I was speaking about grad just in our back, back away from the water. It's the same thing. If you if you have a piece of property that you were on a lake, a capacity lake, you will not get a secondary suite in any structure. Okay. Another question on the secondary suite: uh, Would it? Uh, would it be piped into the same septic system or would there have to be individual septic system? So through you, Mayor Clarkson, you can do either. You can apply to the public health to see if your current system is large enough to support the addition of the, the, the space that's being proposed or, and you may have to install a, an entire new septic system that would serve both buildings or you do have the option of having a second system on the property as long as your the property can support two systems and how far they are away from buildings and lot lines and meeting all the setbacks 
So where would these additional residential units be? Well, we, we haven't worked all the details out. We are, you know, we're not uh, in favor of them being on private roads because you're putting uh, like fire routes that have already issues with getting down them in the winter time because that's a life safety element. When you go back to the beginning of where secondary suites came from, because everything that gets put into the act and the building code for that matter always seems to start in the cities. So when you think about the beginnings of where the idea came for these, and in the cities they also call, call them uh, laneway houses. Uh, because they were meant to be put into place to help with the affordable, the, the housing issues in the big cities. So when you apply that same principle out in the country out here, we have to look at them a little bit differently. We have to make sure that they're going into locations that they can, the fire department can get to them, the EMS can get to them. We don't want to create, we don't want to make a situation worse than it is. So we're going to look at fire routes. We're going to look at private roads. We have to look at at capacity lakes. Those are all the things that we are going to research as we go through this process. Okay. Where are we now? We've had our motion. Nope. Councillor Armstrong. Yes, I would be happy to make the motion uh, to give direction to the planning department to research and coordinate the preparation of a planning report and a draft zoning amendment as stated here. And do we have a second? Deputy Mayor Windover, all in favor? Motion is carried. Okay, Adele, an extension to timeline regarding demolition agreement. Yes, through you, Madam Mayor, this report is in regard to a request by the property owners of 152 Fire Route 284 to extend the timelines in a demolition agreement they entered into last year in May. A number of delays occurred in their construction and occupancy of the new dwelling, and it has caused a request to extend their demolition date to September 30th, 2022, and has prompted an amendment to their agreement. Therefore, it's being recommended that the report be received from the planner regarding the extension of time for the demolition of two existing structures identified in the demolition agreement. And secondly, that council authorize the execution of a replacement agreement to, to demolish between the municipality of Trent Lakes and the property owners to extend the date of demolition and that uh, bylaw in agreement is under the bylaw section of today's agenda for council's consideration. Okay, comment. Oh, Council Ramsett. It's just a comment. I mean, I understand the delays. I mean, there's lots of issues with getting materials and things. So lots of projects are delayed because of that sort of infrastructure still falling apart. So I think this is a reasonable request. Okay, so do you want to make that a motion or we do this later? Do it later. Okay, anybody else want to comment? I just make a like making motion in support. Okay, can we take that motion now, Jesse? Sure. Okay, all right, so uh, the motion to support this is by Councillor Franzen and uh, did, Gary, did you want to do the secondary? Sure. Okay, and that motion is all in favor? <clears throat> motion is carried. Okay, Sarah, uh, consent application, please. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. On today's agenda, there's a municipal appraisal form for consent file B-43-22, submitted by Alan William Aisling on behalf of the owner, Richard Wesley Aisling. The subject plan is located at 3478 County Road 507. The application conforms to the official plan as the proposed use of a hobby farm and home industry will continue to operate. No change of use has been proposed. The resulting lot addition will bring the previously undersized hobby farm on the benefiting parcel into conformity with bylaw B2014-070. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that council supports the proposed severance with the following conditions. One, that a merger agreement be entered into between the transfer, transferee, and the municipality and registered on title at the applicant's expense. And two, 
that the barn on the retained parcel undergoes a change of use to prohibit the structure from housing livestock. Thank you. Okay, do we have uh, questions for this or do we have somebody who would like to offer a motion? Okay, Councilor Lemton. Motion to approve. To approve. Okay, and you're going Consent to second it. Okay, and that's Deputy Mayor Windower. All in favor? That's carried. Thank you, Sarah. But you're not done yet. <laughs> Consent application for B6522. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. On today's agenda, there's a municipal appraisal form for consent file B-65-22 submitted by Joshua Fawcett, the agent, on behalf of the owner, and I apologize if I mispronounce, uh, Zinguoli. <laughs> the subject land is located at 140 Fire Route 103. The application conforms to the official plan as the proposed use of the lands is not changing from its current residential use. Both the benefiting and retained lands were the result of a severance in 2012, known as file number B-18-12. As a result, a cancellation certificate will be required for the lands legally described as part of Lot 17, Concession 16, Registered Plan 45R-15728, Parts 1 and 2, or the benefiting lot, to facilitate a legal merger of the severed lot with the benefiting parcel. Staff have reviewed the application and recommend that Council supports the proposed severance with the following conditions. One, a rezoning of the benefiting parcel to address all areas of non-compliance with bylaw B 2014-070. Two, a merger agreement be entered into between the applicant and the municipality and registered on title at the applicant's expense, which would require the removal of the existing easement described legally as parts three, four, five, and six, Plan 45R-15728. Three, a cancellation certificate for the benefiting lot to facilitate, facilitate a legal merger of the severed lot with the benefiting parcel. And four, the solicitor for the applicant is to provide an undertaking in writing, which confirms the lands are being conveyed to an abutting property owner and a merger of title shall take place. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion? to support that consent Council, application. Councillor Lamb says. Yes, and uh, comment and second. Deputy Mayor Windover, all in favor? Motion is carried. Finance, Donna. <clears throat> Thank you and through you. Before you, it's um, a list of the accounts payable for June and July for your information. Did we have a motion to uh, accept these? Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Armstrong. Any comment? All in favor? Motion is carried. Administration, Bianca. Draft volunteer policy. Uh, thank you and through you. Attached to the agenda is the draft volunteer policy. Um, the draft presented today includes the revisions made after taking into consideration the comments received from council, um, the volunteers, as well as our insurers. Um, staff have received additional comments um, on this draft from a council member and we plan on making those revisions to the policy um, just to clarify one of the sections um, regarding the responsibilities. So staff are recommending that council support this draft policy um, and additionally to direct staff to meet with the volunteers um, within the scope of this policy. We're looking to receive final comments from volunteers and to bring back the final version of the policy uh, for council's approval. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have comments? Councillor Branson. Yeah, it used to be pretty simple to be a volunteer for councils to have volunteers that worked in their community centers, etc. But now it's getting more and more complicated all the time, like everything else. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Councillor Lamson. And, and the Aon report kind of stated that too. I mean, we have, to yeah. have some responsibility, and everyone has to take some responsibility. I mean, this is going to help. I hope that we can all get on the same page and everybody yeah. can work together. And, up with a good agreement. Well, and I think it's extremely important that the people be uh, made to understand just how valuable they are uh -huh. mm -hmm. and that this, as much as anything, is to protect them so that they uh, they come out of there with a sense of, uh, of value, but also that maybe they are being more protected than what they were initially. So, 
think there's a there's a selling job to do here, I'll tell you. Yeah. But we're gonna have a lot of empty spaces. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so uh can we have a motion at this point, or did we already? Or does anybody else want to speak to this? Or did we? I'll make the motion and perhaps a comment after we have a seconder. Okay. I'll second the motion. Uh, Franzen, and your seconding? Yes. Uh, the comment is just, I, I congratulate staff. This has been a very challenging one to write. I know that you've taken the input of many, many groups and incorporated it. Um, you know, in particular, carving out uh, a class of volunteers who are just volunteers for one-off events, whether it be dinners or carnivals or whatever. So I think it was quite a, a challenging thing to identify all of those different groups which you have in this policy and you know align the requirements as best you can with their responsibilities and trying not to overburden them. So it's a very tricky line to, to, yeah. to, 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 to follow. I think you've done as good a job as you can um, my only other comment is I'm hoping that this will not take very long to go out and get the input and come back to this council in the next couple of months. Please. I think this I think this township is unique and I think it came through with the awards uh, dinner that we went through it in, uh, about a month or so ago. This township is basically run by volunteers. You know, we've got staff to do certain things, but if you look at our community centers, our community centers are run by volunteers. We had to pay people to go in and do what these people do. We would be closing the doors. So we're unique that we have the, the community centers and we're unique that we have the volunteers. And uh, I think it's uh, I think it's extremely valuable that we that we do realize just uh, the uniqueness of who we are. You know, that the one, uh, that, I can't think of his name, but he was what, 90, 95 Jack years Clark. old, 98 years old. Jack Clark. Yeah. 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 You know, that man has been a volunteer all of his life. And, uh, you know, as I said, it, when, when we did the speeches at the end of it, counselors come and go, uh, staff come and go. But our volunteers are here year in and year out, year yeah. in and year out. And uh, in a lot of cases, they're just almost invisible. Yeah. So, I think you were talking about John Jackson in that yeah. moment there. Oh, I'm sorry. And yeah. it, it's it's a lifetime of volunteers. Yeah. It's a pretty amazing person. Oh, yeah. That's why I got the award. And the other ones are, you know, coming up behind that are doing the same thing. Yeah. It's, uh... Okay, and, so. And you have a person like Madeline Pearson that uh, in her 90s now we're still volunteering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've, got, we've got them. Okay, so uh, we've had a comment. I think all we do now is vote, right? All in favor? Motion is carried. Donna, summary reporting for the uh, Q2 2022. Thank you, Mr. Yu. Uh, before you is the second new report for the quarterly reporting to council. So we do have staff from every department here if you do have any questions. Okay. Yes, I, I have just a comment. Uh, it's a great report, very easy to read, and uh, provides us with lots of information. Outside that, I don't really have anything to add. Okay. You're not gonna, you're not gonna take the meat off the bone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do have one, one, one little question. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> Uh, when, when we got the county uh, thing on the, uh, on health and wellness. Uh, we got that we were the second oldest municipality in Peterborough. I mean, population, our population mm -hmm. was second oldest. The mean age was 58 years old. In this report, it says that we're like in the low 50s. Oh. So uh, I don't know if there's a difference between average and mean. Yes, there is. That's exactly the difference. 51 is the average, 58 is the mean. And what's the difference? The mean is the middle point, so that half of the people are younger and half of the people are older, okay. where the average is just taking all of them and dividing by the total number. Okay. It's just a numeric. Okay. And we are getting younger. We are? Yeah. Okay. No. We're the only one in the county that is, but we are getting younger. Yeah, I think so. You no, know, the census for, um, the census showed the mean age going from 56 to 58 from 2016 to 2021. Well, then it was the housing that put us down. As being younger. 
because we are getting younger. There are some age groups which have increased within that, but the overall mean and average have gone. And some of the older ones are hanging in there. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> We're living longer and that's a good thing. They're for some moving, of us. moving around with our averages. <laughs> No, but all we have to do is look at the school to see how the numbers have gone up. Right? Mm -hmm. To know that we've got to... <clears throat> You say the same thing in the Bob Public School, but the mean age has been going up, but the, the school is just overpacked so many portables and so many new students coming into the school. We're going to, we're, we're going to outlive them yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we need a motion to support this, I think. Uh, Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Lambsett, all in favor? Motion is carried. Corporate services, Anne, please. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to Council. This report brings forward Council expenses submitted for the month of June and the remainder of expenses submitted for the month of May for Council's consideration and approval. Thank you. Okay, motion, please. Okay, Deputy Mayor Windover and Councillor Lambshead, all in favor. Motion is carried. And you're on again, please. Council at Conference and Expense Claims. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to Council, this report responds to direction from Council to bring forward revisions to both the Council Conferences and Expense Claims Policy and the Employee Expense Claims Policy to include a daily maximum for meal expenses. For consistency and fairness, the revised policies will be effective for the new term of Council commencing on November 15th, 2022. Thank you. Okay, could we have a motion, please? Councillor Armstrong, all in favor? Yes. Motion is carried. Uh, and committee and board structure review. Thank you. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to Council. Staff have prepared this report contemplating the end of the term of Council and the end of term for current committee and board appointments. The Trent Lakes Public Library is under the management and control of the Library Board and there are no changes to board composition recommended at this time. In regard to the Police Services Board, the Ministry of the Solicitor General is in the process of restructuring the Police Service Board framework in Ontario and it is anticipated that additional information regarding the transition to a new OPP detachment board will be forthcoming. The board will continue to function as it currently does pending further information from the Ministry. Staff are recommending that consideration be given to expanding the appeal role of the Committee of Adjustment Property Standards Committee to hear muzzle order appeals under the municipality's animal control bylaw. Should council direct staff to proceed with a review of the committee's establishing bylaw, staff would also seek opportunities to align content with the municipality's procedure bylaw and the committee and board policy to the extent possible for greater corporate consistency. In regard to the municipality's two advisory committees, being the Parks, Recreation and Culture Advisory Committee and the Economic Development Advisory Committee, staff are recommending that these committees be put on pause and that determination of an advisory committee structure be postponed pending completion of the Economic Development, Tourism and Recovery Strategic Plan, the Open Spaces Master Plan and new Council Strategic Planning Exercise. The outcome of these projects, along with the situational appraisals of the current advisory committees, will provide valuable input into what the future advisory committee structure should look like. All appointments to the current advisory committee will expire with the end of term on November 14th, and should council opt for this approach, staff would postpone the posting of vacancies. In regards to the matters of extending the term of the existing committee brought forward in today's delegation by the chair of the PRCAC, uh, there is always a transitional period with the change of term, uh, often bringing a shift in priorities, new ideas, and potentially new people. Uh, the end of term will have been anticipated by the existing committees, and now is the opportunity to wrap up current initiatives to the extent possible and to position them uh, and or to position them to be considered by future committee, staff, or council. Uh, a few things I'd just like to identify for consideration. Uh, public members should be appointed by the new council under which they will function. Uh, some current committee members may opt to run in the municipal election and if successful, be unable to continue as public appointees. Others may not wish to extend the term of their appointment. 
The composition of the existing committees will likely change to some extent with the appointment of council representatives in the new term. And in regard to both the Open Spaces Master Plan and the Economic Development, Tourism and Recovery Strategic Plan, these projects included provisions to allow for the existing advisory committees and current council to provide feedback on the draft plans with final plans being presented to new council for approval following the municipal election. This framework was established to specifically address the change of term and ensure input from current advisory committees. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, please. Councillor Lampton. So what you just said there is that the PRCAC and the PDAC committees can still function as they are through until we have some other strategic direction or because I think that was the whole idea of that presentation is to try and keep them functioning so that they can be have input into all these initiatives that are not going to be completed by the end of this council and will be possibly changed slightly when the next council comes in, but they just didn't want to lose their, the footing that they'd had and try to keep this moving forward. Through you, Mayor Clarkson, to the councillor. Um, so, as I said, typically um, public members would be appointed by the new council uh, under which they'll function. So it would be unusual, that would be our, our um, typical process under committee and board policy. We would advertise um, in advance of the new term starting and we would look at appointments happening within the first uh, couple of months of council, uh, new council taking office. Um, the two, uh, we were aware that the, the two um, key documents, the strategic planning documents, would span the um, election. Uh, and like I said, those projects, uh, the timelines were specifically um, identified to ensure that we would have input from both the existing and uh, the new council, as well as the existing um, advisory committees. So uh, that was built in. Uh, I understand that those projects won't come to final um, completion till the end of January, uh, but yes, they're, they're, it would be unusual for the existing committees to be extended. Uh, the report does include an alternative um, that should council wish to approve continuation of the existing advisory committees, uh, staff be directed to review the terms of reference for both the PRCAC and EDAC and report back to Council on recommended revisions and proceed with posting for public members immediately after the 2022 municipal election. That would be in accordance with our current policy. Um, if we were to do so, it would be suggested that we keep that review high level, recognizing that the priorities of Council could change with the strategic planning exercises that are coming forward. Councillor Armstrong? Yeah, thank you. If you met her. Um, thanks, Sam, for all that. I, I personally would like to see the committees continue at least to the end of the year. I realize it presents some logistics issues. Um, it would appear, based on the presentation from uh, Bob Taylor Basie, that the members of the PRCAC are willing to continue. So I think we can make that assumption. Uh, I don't know about EDAC. We'd need to, I guess, confirm with Dave Reed whether or not those committee members are willing to continue, but uh, the projects are somewhat delayed. I would hate for the co current committee members not to have adequate opportunity to provide input to those uh, projects. So I personally would agree with everything in your recommendation with the exception of the last point, and I would change it to read that the existing committee members continue on uh, unless they are elected into office uh, until, I don't know what the date is, end of the year, early first quarter. Um, Maybe we just, until we have our strategic priorities figured out, which would be January, February, anyway. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's fine with me. <laughs> so let's say through January. Councillor Branson. I, I, I think we do have to contact Dave Reed and see uh, if the member of the VDAC. So I propose, uh, propose that we defer this motion to our meeting in September. Good. I think that's I think that's a good uh, I think that's a good motion. I 
I have problems with uh, economic development and EDAC, uh, not EDAC, economic mm -hmm. development and the other one, uh, being uh, joined together. I think economic development has a has a different role. I think their role is entrenched in the uh, in the development of financial uh, success and tourism, and it sort of brings all of those things together that council depend upon in order to try to move the area forward. I think the the other one is more it is more social, and I hate to see it. Uh, being given too much credibility to be able to hold decisions back that those decisions maybe should be made by council. Like we have, we, I say we because I'm part of it now, but council get elected to make decisions. Yeah. And we can use people to gather information, but we don't want that information to, to overrule the, the responsibilities that we take on when we go in, in, in to the ballot box. So I think there's a fine line between having committees drive council and council uh, garner information from committees. Just in observation. Sort of process. They are advisory committees of council. We are giving them the direction to do what they do. So I think they are just coming back with advice. If we choose to take or not take that advice, that's the decision of council. That's where we should make those decisions. Also with the Committee of Adjustment, I, I think that's another review there that should be taken. I, I think that that's probably the right venue for some of these other orders and appeal orders. I think that's, it is a quasi-judicial committee, so it does have some of the rights to do those, some of those things. I think that part of the, the recommendation is absolutely on point. So going back then to your recommendation with this, yep be further looked at and brought a motion back to defer till uh, our, our first September meeting. Okay. So everybody in favor so of that? we can have comments from our chairs of our committee. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Perfect. Okay. And that could be added to the motion that we get comments from both of our major committees. All right. <clears throat> uh, all in favor? The motion is carried. Is it a recess anyway? Sure. Uh, we need a we we need a ten minute recess. Or eleven minutes or whatever <laughs> you need.
Commission's policy review. Thank you, through you, Mark Clarkson. Uh, the municipal act requires that the municipality adopt and maintain policies with respect to the relationship between members of councils and the officers and employees of the municipality. And the municipality originally approved their council staff relations policy in, uh, as required by March 1st, 2019. A comprehensive update to the policy has been completed and staff recommend approving the council staff relations policy. There's a bylaw on the agenda today uh, containing the policy. Okay, do we have any uh, mm -hmm. any comments? I'd like to make a motion to receive the report from the Director of Corporate Services Clerk regarding Council Staff Relations Policy Review for our information. Do we have a second? Thank you, Mayor Windover. All in favor? Motion is carried. Correspondence for information. Does anybody want to bring anything forward? Motion to repeat. Thank you. And second to that, Councillor Lambsand, all in favor? Correspondence for action, removal of municipal councillors under prescribed uh, circumstances. Are we going to support this or receive it? Motion to receive. Thank you, Councillor Franson. Yeah. Councillor Armstrong, seconder, all in favor? Motion is carried. Bigfield Herald advertising request. Uh, motion. We have enough in our budget for this. Thank you, through you. Yes, there's $1,960 remaining in the council advertising budget at this time. Okay. Uh, Councillor Franson, did you want to? Motion to support. Okay. And a seconder, Councillor yeah. Lambshead, all in favor? Peterborough and Quartha's Chamber of Commerce sponsor request. Motion. Based on Donna's information, motion to support. Okay, Councillor Armstrong and uh, Deputy Mayor Windover all in support. All in favor. Motion is carried. City of Brantford, potential threat to residential mm -hmm. home ownership. Motion to receive. Thank you. And seconded, uh, Deputy Mayor Windover. All in favor. Motion is carried. Ontario Sheep Farmers, Livestock, Guardian Dogs. Motion. Motion to receive. Thank you. And seconded by Councillor Branson. All in favor? Motion is carried. <laughs> Seeking prosperity and partnership with Indigenous nations and a timely resolution of Halimun Tract land dispute. I don't know we know much about this. Uh, motion. Councillor Armstrong. Motion to receive. Thank you. And a seconded by Councillor Franzen. All in favor? Motion is carried. Township of Millimere Climate Emergency. Motion, please. Councillor Armstrong. A motion to receive, although I think the whole concept of a climate emergency is something that the new council should consider in their strategic planning session. So at this point, I would say just motion to receive. Seconded? I'll second it with a comment. Go ahead. I, I believe a lot of the points in here are valid, and I, I think that uh, maybe they should be looked at by the new council. Well, it doesn't take anything away from us to go ahead and support it now because what it does is get it on the radar. Yeah. But if anybody wants to. No. Right. It there? Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Bylaws. Jeffy? <laughs> Thank you. There was one bylaw on today's agenda uh, that didn't have a public meeting or corresponding staff report, and that was B2022 86 to stop up, close, and transfer parts of the shoreline road allowance uh, for properties described in series 28. Okay. So we need a motion and a seconder for this one. You want to see a mover? Motion to approve. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Lamb said, and Anybody else? Sorry, this is 2022-086. Yes. We're putting, yep, yeah, I'll second that. Series. Okay. Uh, Councillor Armstrong, all in favor. Motion is carried. Council staff relations policy, motion, please. If we agree with this, Councillor Armstrong. Approved. Councillor Lampshead, all in favor. See, I was doing well there for a while. Perfect. Perfect. And that motion carried. Demolition agreement. Motion, please. 
Councillor. Motion to approve. Name said. All in favor? Councillor Franzen. Nope. Nope. Yes. So. All in favor? Motion is carried. Business arising out of a previous meeting. Do we have anything here? Seeing none. Okay, I'm removing myself from the chair for this motion. Okay. I'm over here now, Ron. Are you over there? Are you okay? So, you want to read it? Now, once this happens, I can now read it. Right? Yes, Dave. Yep, yes, All right. Yep. You want to? Okay. Read? Yes. Right. Yeah, ready? Okay. Um, State notice of a motion. Whereas there are currently high costs of fuel, mm -hmm. housing, and food, and whereas minimum wage cannot support the high costs of today, and whereas a stable house and income prevents child poverty, family breakups, and whereas there are significant pressures on employers trying to hire for startup positions, and whereas this program needs to be recognized as a hand up, not a handout. There it be resolved that the municipality of Trent Lakes petition the provincial government to reinstate the basic income pilot project implemented by the previous government and to reinstate a living wage and further that a copy of this motion be sent to Peterborough County Council to Dave Smith of Peterborough Kawartha. Now this would not be a, an open handed, the way that this operates is at the end of each three month section, the person who is working contacts whoever to say that you know that the, the work is being done and then they're topped up to whatever that wage happens to be but uh, I've had really good response from the interview that I did on uh, on radio and I don't know how they picked it up but I think the time has come uh, what this came out of was when we when we've had all these reports on homelessness and all the rest of this stuff we can't provide housing cheap enough that a person on 18 or $20 an hour can buy. We have to be able to somewhere top it up. So I'm asking for support. I'll second. Sure. Thank you. Through you, Deputy Mayor Winder, where's now in the chair? Okay, you have to now ask for support. Okay. Yeah. You seconded, did you? Yes, I'll second yeah, that okay. motion. Okay, and uh, so, uh, so we do have a motion to uh, the uh, code yeah. support. Okay. 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 Liens on report to make journal boards and committees. I think we did that at the beginning. We have, don't have anything that we've added to it today, do we? I don't think. Any other information items? Yes. Oh, I'm inviting everybody to the music at the park tonight, mm -hmm. uh, 6.30 to 8, and the yeah. fireflies are, yeah. are performing. Now, if we could have a motion to go into close, please, to discuss personal matters about an identifiable individual, including municipal or local board employees, labor relations or employee negotiations, and advice that is subject to solicitor client privilege, including communications necessary for that purpose. And anyone that is listening or viewing the electronic meeting may remain on the line for when council arises when closed. Then we have a motion, please. Councillor Armstrong and Councillor Lamson, all in favor? The motion is carried.
So rise and vote. Yep. Motion to rise. Motion to rise. Second. Yeah. Motion to rise from Coast. Perfect. Done. Okay. Seconder. All Carol. Favor. Okay. Carol. Okay. All in favor? Okie dokie. Carry. I'll mix in. Okay. Business arising out of closed session. Okay. Uh, do we have to with the fire uh, right. deputy uh, fire nope. chief? Okay. I'll make the motion okay, to yeah. so, uh, confirming bylaw. That, sorry, we're, we're on the right. adopt the minutes. Of, I'll make a motion. Eighteen point oh, one will adopt the minutes of the previous closed session. Yep. Okay. Second. Okay. All in favor. All in favor. Okay. Yeah. Now I'll make my motion. Sorry to adopt the confirming bylaw. Okay. I'll second that. Okay, all in favor? Okay. Okay. Gary, I will make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Good. Okay, good. Gary and Carol. Okay, good. All in favor? All in favor? Yeah, good. Okay. Good. Here.